I will also, I, I would love to introduce Geronimo. Geronimo Castaneda, we are delighted to welcome you. Geronimo is the conservation project manager uh, for Audubon, California. His work focuses on habitat restoration, enhancement, and multi-benefit management of Central Valley wetlands, agricultural operations, and groundwater recharge projects to benefit birds and people. One of his projects of focus is the protection and conservation of tricolored blackbirds in the Central Valley. Current projects, um, I, Geronimo, I may let you describe your current projects, but I will say Geronimo is a native of California and has lived and worked from Monterey to Arcata. With short adventures along the East Coast, eventually he found his way to Sacramento, which is uh, where he now works in with Audubon, California. Away from work, Geronimo spends time working on his new home, riding bikes, cooking, and of course, birding. So we're glad to have you. Over to you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to, to come uh, speak with you and meet you all. I'm, I'm pretty excited and hopefully in the future, I'll actually be able to come out and, and we can all meet up in person. Um, but in the meantime, technology is great and glad, glad again to be able to share. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, and yeah, I, I guess I'd like to also just offer maybe a few more kind of words about myself. Um, I, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and my first uh, real kind of love of birds uh, came about when my parents would take me and my, my siblings to the Baylands there. Uh, so just around the, the marsh and um, it was always fun to see all the ducks and the shorebirds with all the different bills and long legs and whatnot. And so it's, I didn't think at the time that I would get into conservation necessarily and uh, definitely not necessarily with birds, but I'm, I'm glad to be working with Audubon and being able to, to do what I can to protect the habitat uh, that they need now and into the future. Um, so today I, I will talk about tricolor blackbirds, but I thought that I'd also share some other work that um, is kind of like in the forefront uh, of, of what I've been doing the last um, year and, and really some of it the last like couple of months. Um, especially in this time where we're in drought um, or we're in extended drought. Um, and so today my presentation is titled Conservation and Drought in the Central Valley. Uh, can they go together? Um, so as we know, uh, the Central Valley landscape was once this really expansive mosaic of wetlands and upland habitats. And over the past century, a vast majority of these habitats have been lost to not only urban growth and expansion, uh, but the development of agricultural lands to non-wildlife friendly crops. Um, and and in more recent times, we are seeing the effects of climate change and what that has been doing, uh, acting as a multiplier of any negative impacts to what remaining habitat and wildlife across uh, the landscape we have left. And so here in this photo, we see a glimpse of what parts of the valley used to look like um, in a moderately wet year. I mean, this is not even uh, the wettest year. Um, you know, so we can see how expansive the wetlands are and how they kind of reach across the valley. Um, but days like this, times like this are now few and far between, um, especially that, again, we're seeing this extended drought. Uh, we see the opposite of this. Um, so uh, what are folks like, like you all and myself doing uh, to support the birds in this time? Um, so something that has recently come down uh, from a big coordinated effort around the current drought 
is, is some funds from uh, the state um, to provide emergency drought relief for birds in the Central Valley. And so Audubon, with this, their proven track record of implementing science-based approaches to con conservation, uh, we've coordinated with some partners, um, particularly the Nature Conservancy in Point Blue, um, to put forth a proposal to the state uh, to access some uh, emergency funds uh, to, to create habitat uh, on the ground. And so, again, in coordination with uh, these other organizations, conservation organizations, uh, we're leading targeted programs uh, aimed to incentivize farmers and wetland operators uh, to create new habitat throughout the Central Valley. Um, and our approach is, is, uh, uses a reverse auction um, and through that, we're able to maximize the benefits uh, of getting the most bang for our buck when it comes to trying to get habitat on the land. Um, and so more specifically, we're taking this, uh, this approach that the Nature Conservancy really kind of spearheaded called Bird Returns. Um, and again, they've created this platform and this process uh, where they uh, solicit landowners to submit bids, um, you know, what they're willing to pay um, or uh, what they're willing, yeah, what they're willing, I guess, to, 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 to receive um, to create X amount of habitat across the landscape. Um, and so by doing this kind of reverse auction style, uh, landowners are letting us know what they see the value of this is. And that allows us to really kind of pick and choose, you know, the best, um, you know, the best bids. And then also we're able to plug that information in, uh, use some, some models that have been developed over the years through collecting uh, the bird data um, and how the birds use these landscapes. Uh, to, to really identify which places uh, the birds need the habitat the most. And so through this uh, emergency program or this emergency funder, funding, we're able to offer four programs in three geographies throughout the Central Valley. Um, we're offering a winter and spring farmlands program. Uh, we're offering uh, a winter and spring wetlands program as well. And these will focus in the Sacramento Valley, uh, the Delta, and then in the Tulare Basin, more specifically. Um, and so the winter program uh, has, has been kicked off just a few weeks ago, and we're really kind of scrambling and putting all our resources together um, to get this program going. And it's, it's really going to focus on providing good habitat for overwintering uh, waterfowl. And so here we see uh, a, nor a pintail, um, one of the iconic species that we see a lot of throughout the Central Valley um, that, that really utilize the wetlands that are across the valley. And again, in times of drought, we don't have enough habitat to support uh, all the waterfowl. And as you may have heard, uh, when that happens, you know, there's a greater likelihood of, of spreading disease uh, in, in the limited habitat areas. Um, and, and also there's may not be enough food for them to, to, to forage on throughout the winter. And so again, this program aims to work with uh, uh, farmers and private wetland operators uh, to create wetland habitat uh, beginning, you know, really soon here um, and through uh, late winter to be sure that all the waterfowl that utilize the Central Valley to overwinter have a safe place and, and plenty of resources uh, to support them throughout the winter. But we realize that uh, waterfowl are not the only ones who use the Central Valley, and we know that it's a critical uh, overwintering and stopover site for hundreds of thousands of migratory shorebirds. And so um, over the years, we've recognized the importance of not only the farmlands, but also um, these 
these private wetlands that historically have been managed as duck hunting clubs, uh, we, we realized the potential for them to provide additional habitat across the landscape for non-waterfowl species. Um, and so working with a lot of wetland owners, we've been able to kind of adjust um, wetland management practices to create uh, a program where these wetland operators, after the duck hunting season, they're able to maintain uh, uh, a bit of wet, wetted habitat and gradually draw down that water um, to create uh, essential habitat for migratory birds during the spring migration. Um, and so this is kind of a snapshot of one of the, the fields that had, or one of the wetland units that has been enrolled in this program in, over the years. And so on the right hand side, we see a picture of a flooded wetland. Um, and on the left hand side, we see a picture of a non flooded wetland. And so this was taken in about April. And so historically, uh, all those folks who own these wetlands, um, they would have looked like the one on the left, providing zero habitat benefits for any water birds. Um, and so again, through our program, we're able to incentivize different folks across the valley um, to create some much needed habitat uh, for our, our little migratory shorebird friends. Um, and so again, this program is a is emergency drought program for this year um, and, and possibly next year. And so this is something that I've been spending a lot of time over the last uh, couple of weeks uh, trying to get off the ground. And so we're really excited to to be able to have this opportunity um, to support birds when, when they need it most. Geronimo, I yeah. have a question on, um, so what happens in these drought years uh, is, are we getting enough water coming down to the valley for these um, private wetland operators to actually produce some wetlands with even with the drought? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And that is something, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's something that we've had to consider. I mean, we worked pretty closely with the Department of Water Resources, as well as with the Department of Fish and Wildlife to try to understand kind of what the limitations are. Um, you know, a lot of these folks, um, even though we are in drought, they still have, a, you know, some amount of water that they have access to. Um, and so therefore, you know, instead of them uh, maybe just flooding a smaller bit of field and saving that water um, for, for some other time, we're asking them to essentially kind of take a risk and say, hey, we'll, we'll be able to pay you X amount of money if you use all, all the water that you have access to right now to create habitat. And then we'll just try to figure it out down the line. Um, you know, so, and, and we're also um, have, again, worked with the Department of Water Resources to allow these folks uh, who pump groundwater um, to to continue to pump groundwater to provide this habitat. Um, you know, in part because if a farmer loses their crops, um, you know, there's there's crop insurance or there's programs where they can recoup some of those costs. However, if the habitat is not on the ground for these birds, you know, there's nothing that can can really save them, or they, um, and so we see that it's a really critical uh, thing that we that we we provide this water. Um, so it is it is a good question. I mean, it is something that's on the back of our minds, and and we hope that um, that you know, that we'll get some rain uh, come this late winter or spring. Right. Thank you. Yeah.
Um, yeah, so that was some drought relief uh, efforts that are, are ongoing at lightning speed. Um, and this second piece is, um, is more specific to water and groundwater and uh, has to do with a longer term project that I've been uh, focused on over the last few years. Um, and so as many of you may have heard, uh, the state of California has started to regulate the pumping of groundwater. And so it has identified certain areas where there's considerable uh, groundwater overdraft, um, which is causing a lot of problems, not only for infrastructure uh, and native habitat, um, uh, but just also even for like domestic wells and stuff like that, they're going dry or, or the water quality is diminishing. I mean, so a lot of folks are trying to figure out, you know, creative ways to, to uh, access more water, get more water into the aquifers um, uh, to store it for later. And so uh, throughout the Central Valley, you know, there's a recognition that water is scarce, especially in this time of drought. Uh, but farmers are, are trying to get creative and innovative and finding ways uh, to put water in the ground. And so in this particular uh, photo here, um, it's a water manager from the Tulare Irrigation District. So um, like Southern San Joaquin Valley and he's standing in a groundwater recharge basin. And so a lot of folks throughout the valley are, are looking to groundwater recharge projects, um, again, to, to kind of increase their water storage capacity uh, increased water that's available to them at a later time um, that they can then pump out. And as you can see here, um, this basin is, is pretty much devoid of any uh, vegetation. There's no habitat features or anything. Um, and so, you know, what Audubon is trying to do, we want to make sure that um, these types of projects uh, not only benefit agricultural users, but also benefit uh, people and birds. And so we want to, we are actively participating in conversations with folks like uh, the Tulare Irrigation uh, District Manager to uh, create multi-benefit projects uh, to ensure that groundwater, again, helps not only uh, birds, uh, but people also. And so one of those projects, uh, again, is down in, in the Tulare area, and it's, it's a pilot project that we have been working with the Lower Deer Creek um, Irrigation District. So that's the, the district is outlined in blue. And working with them, we were able to secure a grant um, to create a watershed conservation plan for this watershed that is outlined in, in the black outline. And so that watershed surrounds what is known as the Lower Deer Creek watershed. Um, and so through this process, we are working with the irrigation district to identify core areas of, of habitat, uh, not only for upland species, um, uh, and like desert scrub birds, but also areas to create multi-benefit groundwater recharge basins. So these basins where when they're flooded, um, they will provide some sort of, of wetland habitat uh, for, for waterfowl, for shorebirds, uh, and even the hope is for tricolored blackbirds. And so we identify this particular area uh, to, to kind of focus this pilot project because it overlaps the Pixley National Wildlife Refuge. And we know that is an area that is uh, critically important for a lot of, um, again, upland species like San Joaquin Kitfox and Blunt-Nosed blunt Leopard Lizard, uh, but also for, for migratory sandhill cranes, uh, tricolored blackbirds, and a lot of other shorebirds and waterfowl as well. Um, and in partnership with uh, some other conservation groups, this is uh, one of the resources that we've created and, and that we've shared with, uh, uh, with 
the water district managers, irrigation district managers, and other agricultural users. Um, and we've uh, used this as kind of a, an example of what we hope uh, the watershed plan will be able to incentivize and implement across the landscape. And so essentially what we're seeing here is a, a created wetland. Um, and on the right hand side, we have the intake and we've created kind of like a marshy area with some vegetation that can act as, um, as like filter strips to kind of filter out sediment, but also maybe any impurities in the water that is coming through. And then in the middle, we have a, a central basin that will be where the majority of the groundwater recharge occurs. Uh, but if we are able to put small islands and maybe some other types of habitat features in there, uh, when it does, when it is in operation and is holding water for groundwater recharge, it can also provide some uh, temporary wetland habitat for species, um, which is especially important uh, in the Southern San Joaquin Valley and, and other places that typically don't uh, have so much wetland habitat. And so the idea is if we can identify uh, great places where there's good connectivity um, and where there's good groundwater recharge and, and multiple benefits to maybe communities to help with uh, um, cleaning some groundwater resources that they rely on. If we can identify good places to put these, uh, it's kind of a win-win for, for everybody. Um, and so we are starting to see projects like this pop up across the landscape. Um, we are currently in, in the permitting process for one, and we're hoping to get it up and running uh, within the next year. And so we're pretty excited about it. It's been a, a couple year process to, to kind of get to this state. Um, and so we look forward to, to getting it on the ground and sharing with you all in the future kind of what comes of, comes of that. Um, and this is just a, a slide showing that, you know, we're not alone in the work that we do. Uh, partners are critically important uh, to the work that, that Audubon does, uh, not only for, for chapters, but for, for the state office and even the national office. And you can see we, we work with a whole diverse group of uh, partners, uh, agricultural folks, uh, state agencies, as well as other uh, conservation organizations. And now uh, to get into tricolored blackbirds. <clears throat> um, and so this has been, uh, when I first came to Audubon, this is where I got plugged in and, and got to learn a lot about this uh, real special, unique species. Um, and, and I've taken over the tricolor blackbird program uh, and, and helped lead those efforts uh, throughout the San Joaquin Valley. And so uh, I'm gonna provide a, a bit of background and overview of the tricolor blackbird and kind of the origins of the program and then, and then kind of fill you all in uh, on what we've been up to the last uh, few years. Um, <clears throat> so prior to, to my arrival at Audubon, the Tricolor Blackbird program was really uh, a grassroots program. Uh, the folks before me, they used to go around the valley and knock on farmers' doors, have con conversations with folks, um, talk about the birds that they were seeing in fields and offer technical assistance to those landowners um, I think it was pretty great to have that connection with folks, um, you know, to be able to just really share that experience with folks and, and kind of answer questions one on one. Um, and, and that had some amount of success. Uh, there were a lot of birds that were protected and saved. Um, however, you know, through various surveying efforts, uh, folks still saw that the birds were in, in significant we're having a significant population decline. And so Audubon in coordination with some other folks uh, sat down and said, how can we really you know, make this effort uh, you know, last longer, more robust? 
Um, <clears throat> and so they realized that the best way to do that was to form partnerships with the agricultural community, um, with association groups, and really get them on board and figure out a way where we could work together uh, to support their constituents uh, while we also protect the birds. And so, as you may all be familiar with, uh, the tricolor blackbird, it's, a, it's near endemic to California. It's the last land-based large colony, colonial bird in North America. Um, unlike their close relatives, the red-winged blackbird, um, during the breeding season, tricolor blackbirds will congregate in these massive colonies, sometimes in excess of 30,000 birds uh, in a single field. Um, and the, the key identifier for the male tricolor blackbirds is that white uh, wing bar that goes across under the red shoulder, uh, unlike the red wing blackbird, which has more kind of a, a tawny yellowish uh, wing bar. And you can see in this photo how, how much it really pops uh, uh, when you make that observation. <clears throat> and a little more challenging are the, the females to identify, but oh, more generally, females are uh, darker. They're not as streaky as red-winged blackbird females. Um, and they tend to have a, a bit of a more narrow bill. And so again, when they're in large flocks, they are still pretty challenging to observe uh, and to identify, but um, if you have the opportunity, those are some key features to, to cue in. And so here's a snapshot of the bird's relative distribution throughout California. Um, this map was generated from data collected during the statewide surveys that some of you may be familiar with. Um, and so we see the majority of the colonies um, are, are located throughout the Central Valley from Redding all the way down. Uh, towards Bakersfield. And we see uh, that not only the majority of the colonies are there, but also the largest colonies. Um, and the main reason for this is historically, that's where the significant amount of, of their native habitat, wetlands, uh, used to be. So here we see a photo of a nest um, that was built in this wetland habitat. Uh, they like to build their nest in this dense emergent vegetation that not only provides good structure to hold their nest, um, but provides a lot of cover from uh, predators, uh, not only from above, from just having a dense kind of canopy, but also below from it being, uh, it being wet. Um, and here is uh, a brief video of a colony in the native wetland. Where was so that, this particular, uh, Yeah, so this is down in Kern County. Um, and this particular site is actually a site where we uh, coordinated with the landowner um, and worked with them and the Natural Resource Conservation Service to uh, provide, to create this uh, nesting habitat for them. So if we didn't have this cooperation, this wetland would be dry during this time of year. And so it's, uh, you know, as you can see, we put the, the habitat on the landscape and they came and, and they nested in large numbers here. <clears throat> now we look at this picture and we see a nest um, in what appears to be wetland vegetation. 
but actually this nest is in uh, a silage field um, in the southern San Joaquin Valley uh, that is being uh, grown, the silage is being grown to be to cows. Um, and so again, historically wetlands like the one I just showed you used to be pretty expansive across the bird's range. And as agriculture moved in and land was converted, that habitat was lost. Um, and birds, you know, being somewhat adapted, adaptable, uh, adaptive, they have uh, found that this, this silage provides really similar um, character, like habitat features, uh, dense vegetation, uh, it retains moisture, uh, and is really similar to uh, emergent vegetation. And so uh, here is another video of a colony that is nesting in one of those silage fields. And so we can see that, um, I mean, it almost looks the exact same as the wetland um, habitat. You know, it's tall, it's dense, and it provides that good structure for the birds. And um, as I mentioned, you know, this silage is associated with dairies. And so in this map, we see um, all the block, black boxes. Uh, that's where the dairies are located. And when we look at where all the colonies are, all the colored circles, we can see that they're kind of in the same places as where these dairies are. And so because the birds are keen in on these areas and nesting in these silage fields, um, we've, we've seen that there's been this direct conflict with, uh, with farmers and their operations. Um, and so we've, we've had to create that partnership that I was alluding to with the, the dairy association folks, other farm groups, to try to work with them and their constituents to find a solution um, to ensure that these birds are protected. Because as these birds nest in the, the silage field, as you see here, um, that nesting period coincides with harvesting time. And so <clears throat> if we weren't out there finding these colonies and communicating with the landowners through our partners, um, our ag partners, essentially these colonies would be, would be lost to, to harvesters. And so for the last six years, uh, we developed this really, uh, you know, coordinated core partnership with uh, other conservation groups, but also uh, the Farm Bureau and Dairy Cares and Western United Dairymen, or actually Western United Dairies, um, to create this, this program that uh, protects colonies that are nesting in these silage fields uh, by providing technical assistance to those farmers. Um, we're working with all of these partners to uh, explore various opportunities uh, for long-term solutions. Um, and we've implemented several pilot projects over the years. Um, we've, we've, by expanding our network through these new partners, we've been able to reach more people uh, to educate not only the general public, but the broader dairy community. Um, and now we're seeing a lot more dairy folks uh, self-report when they have birds on their property. And so that's a, that's a big win that we see. And then also just connecting into that community more, we're able to reach more folks uh, about uh, opportunities to do habitat restoration and, and enhancement. Uh, similar to the, the one where I showed that video of those birds in that wetland. And so it's been a long, uh, a long journey, uh, but we're still pushing forward and, and we've created these strong uh, relationships with these folks. Um, and, and to date, uh, we've been able to protect over 800,000 nesting tricolor blackbirds um, across 73 colonies and we've created over 100 acres of native habitat 
um, in their in their range. And so, in our eyes, it's a really big win. You know, we still have a long ways to go uh, to ensure that the birds are protected and uh, and can have a sustainable population. Um, but we see that we're making progress. Um, and and that, in my eyes, was really highlighted in the results of the statewide survey. And so in the last statewide survey, it was 2017, uh, we documented approximately 178,000 tricolor blackbirds. Um, but as you can see from the, the graph, uh, in 2008, there were close to about 400,000 birds detected. And in the subsequent six years, uh, when the statewide survey was conducted, um, the, the number of tricolored blackbirds was significantly reduced. Uh, but 2014 was about the year when this partnership really formed um, and when we were, we put a lot of coordinated effort into doing outreach to producers, creating habitat, doing pilot projects. Um, and even though there's only one year of data, 2017, uh, we did see a, a slight uptick in the number of birds that were detected. Um, you know, and so again, it's only one year of data, but to me, it's pretty, it's a good sign that it did not continue to go down. Um, and then between 2017 and, and now, I mean, just based on my observations and what we see each year, nesting year, uh, the number of birds observed in just the Southern San Joaquin Valley has stayed around 178,000 birds. And so if we think about those birds plus any birds um, that the statewide survey would have potentially detected elsewhere throughout the, the state. I mean, we should be seeing maybe 200, 200,000 plus birds uh, in the next statewide survey. And so, as I mentioned uh, prior to the presentation to some folks that logged on early, uh, the last uh, statewide survey was supposed to take place in 2020. Uh, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we, we canceled it. Um, and then this last year, there was still a lot of uncertainty, and so we, we canceled it again. Uh, so the goal is to um, to host the statewide survey uh, in 2022. So hopefully, so y'all can can join that effort um, because it's going to be really essential to uh, informing us how we've been doing with the the conservation program um, and the protection of tricolor blackbirds. And regardless of our significant efforts, I mean, we still see continuing challenges. Uh, again, you know, we are faced with the recognition that we've lost over 95% of Central Valley wetlands. Um, land is, is continuing to be converted. Uh, not only to urban development, uh, but also to uh, to agricultural uses, um, and then just water availability. I mean, we see it more now um, in these last few years with with uh, increasing drought conditions, and so we have to start getting more creative, um, start leaning into developing new partnerships, um, uh, create look for new opportunities to create habitat, uh, to create these multi-benefit projects uh, that will provide, you know, not only groundwater recharge, but some habitat uh, for tricolors and other species. Um, and then continuing to be diligent about protecting uh, the remaining colonies and ensure that they're successful in nesting and they can, they can rear young uh, to add to the population. Um, and just these last couple of slides uh, are just kind of a reminder of, of you know, the expanse of wetlands that used to stretch across the valley. Um, so that's the red and the riparian areas are the green. Um, and that's what we see in this middle panel. And then on the far right panel, we see how much of that is remaining. And, and it's, not, it's not that much. 
And so we need to, uh, seeing that these wetlands are continuing to be under threat uh, from, from all angles, um, we need to live up to our promise of protecting those that remain. And, and we haven't really been doing that great of a job of that uh, so far. Um, this map shows all the wildlife areas and national wildlife refuges that were supposed to get water delivered to them. And the green is good and the red and yellow is, is not so good. And so uh, down in key tricolor blackbird areas down, down south near Pixley and Kern National Wildlife Refuges, we can see that they only are receiving 1% to 30% of the water that is uh, that is owed to them on an annual basis. And so myself and other colleagues are working really hard with uh, agency folks and other partners um, to try to press folks to, to ensure that these refuges are receiving that water, uh, not only for tricolor blackbirds, um, but for all the other species that use them uh, throughout the year, waterfowl, migratory shorebirds, and other resident species. Who, who uh, makes that decision? Um, yeah, so that is, so the water to the wetlands is part of the Central Valley Project Improvement Act, which was passed, I believe, in the early 90s. Um, and that piece of legislation requires the Bureau of Reclamation to send a certain amount of water to all of those refuges. Um, and the Bureau has kind of handed down that responsibility to, um, even though they're responsible, they've worked with more local agencies to direct that water to those refuges. Um, and so because those agencies are very ag-centric, it's been a challenge um, to get the water to those refuges at times when they actually need the water. Um, so sometimes they can get all that water, but it comes at the wrong time. Um, a lot of times, you know, because it's going through these ag-centric agencies, um, you know, the, the refuges and the wetlands are kind of the bottom of the pecking order when it comes to, uh, to water deliveries. And so really, I mean, the Bureau has the legal power to enforce it, uh, but they're just choosing not to for some, you know, because the agricultural industry is very powerful and, and uh, yeah, and I, I don't think that they want to. I mean, I'm sure there are other reasons too, um, that I'm just not aware of, but that that's kind of my basic understanding of what's going yeah, it's on. Yeah, isn't that the same kind of situation they have up in the Klamath area with uh, most of the water going to agriculture and they're having all kinds of issues with uh, low water levels on wildlife refuges, um, just like in right. California, yeah. Right, right, definitely. Yeah, I mean, and I think one of the differences there actually though is that um, the refuges in the Klamath Basin area, they uh, they don't have the same kind of legal agreement that these refuges in the Central Valley have. Um, so, I mean, you are correct that the water is going to the ag, ag users. Um, <clears throat> And so any water that had been going to the refuge was just kind of a, an agreed upon amount, but I don't know if there was necessarily any legal uh, basis for them to, to receive that water, um, uh, unlike there is with those, those refuges in, in the San Joaquin Valley, in the Central Valley. Um, but I did hear that uh, who was it? The California Waterfowl Association successfully um, was able to transfer, I think, 7,500 acre feet of water uh, to the refuge uh, in the Klamath, the Klamath Refuge, which is not, you know, not a lot, 
compared to what they're used to. I think they're used to like 20,000 acre feet. But before that 7,500 acre feet, uh, I think they had like a thousand. Uh, wow. And so even though it's it's not the full amount, it's uh, I think it's going to be have a, a positive impact for sure. One of the other questions I had was, why are the are the tricolored um, surveys only every three years? Um, that's a good question. And in short, because whoever set up that that effort, they did it before I, I came along. <laughs> um, and I, uh, but I I think it's. I feel like it's kind of a common, uh, it's kind of kind of a common timeline for these types of efforts, um, just because it, you know, it may if you do a survey one year, and then if something happens, some event happens within the population, um, it might take a couple of years for it to show up uh, when you do the counts. So it might not be, uh, you might not be able to really see the effects of some event um, if you count them in this year and then the next year. But if you wait a couple of years, then you might see it. And also it's a, it's a big effort. You know, it's all volunteer right. um, led, you know, chapters play a huge role. So thank you for that. Um, and, and so it takes a lot of effort to kind of coordinate that and be sure everyone is on the right page and, and we know where to go and, and everyone's trained up and stuff, so. Uh, does, does anyone uh, anyone else have any questions for Geronimo? So I, I have a question. I'm, I'm sorry, I just, I tried to write it into the chat and fumbled it. How <laughs> You said that um, the recharge program was receiving state funding. How stable is that? Is that something that you think will continue? Um, well, the re so the recharge projects, uh, yeah, they have received some state funding through the Department of Water Resources. Um, you know, I think because these projects are being developed under, as a result of the implementation of state legislation, um, a lot of people feel, and I think the state feels this way too, that they have a responsibility to, to help support uh, landowners and water users to, to be successful and reaching their sustainability goals that are being required. And so, um, yeah, I mean, and so I think, you know, who knows what 10, 15 years will look like, but so far every year we've been seeing uh, a slug of money come down through the state for programs uh, or projects similar to this. Um, and so, we're in the beginning of, of getting these types of multi-benefit projects, recharge projects uh, actually constructed. And so there hasn't really been a whole lot of science surrounding you know, the potential benefits or the, the potential negative impacts. And so, again, we're hoping in the next couple of years, we can get some of these on the ground, uh, do some bird surveys, um, do some adaptive management um, and, and see what we can learn. And hopefully, you know, we can develop some management practices um, that will provide benefits to, to birds and, and not harm them. Um, yeah, and, and along those lines, uh, the federal government, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, they've uh, kind of been keeping a close eye on these types of projects and these efforts and uh, have started their own kind of preliminary conversations, uh, 
uh, and whatnot about potential funding mechanisms uh, through uh, federal grants and whatnot to support these types of programs. And so I think he, you know, the writing is on the wall that this, you know, these projects and programs are needed. And, and so uh, the governments at, at all levels are seeing that and, and are willing to kind of step in. And so uh, kind of a long answer, <laughs> but <laughs> I think I think there will be funding uh, for the foreseeable future uh, to support these efforts. That's great, That's great to hear. And uh, uh, good luck as you keep building. And you know, it seems like you've done really well with the the dairy industry. And and good luck as you keep building those connections. Um, I have a question. So. Uh, with the, the tricolored blackbirds um, nesting in those huge colonies, is there any, any information, any studies? I don't know how it would be done, but I, I think of the passenger pigeon. And, uh, you know, that just the populated nosedive when apparently the vast numbers that stimulated nesting, as I understand it, uh, were, were taken down below a threshold. That's interesting. Uh, did we lose that? I don't know. We lost your audio, Dan. Hey, we may have lost him. I, I, I mean, I can't, I think maybe I, oh, is he back? I don't think so. He's on uh, there. Did, did you not hear me? No. Yeah, oh, we, yeah, we, we lost you, you uh, part of the way through there. I was just looking for a comparison of uh, nesting numbers needed in tricolor blackbirds versus uh, uh, passenger pigeons. Yeah, that is a, um, you know, that's a great question. And that's one of the reasons why uh, why we do the statewide survey because it's our, our most comprehensive uh, effort to understand the, the overall population and the numbers and, and to kind of see, you know, how many birds are out there and how many birds are reproducing. Uh, I don't, we have not, we, we have a tricolor blackbird working group, you know, with with Audubon and other conservation groups, state and federal agencies, uh, folks from UC Davis and some other researchers. Um, and, and that's one of the things that we, we don't really know yet is what, what is that threshold? And part of the challenge there is that we don't know what their uh, their kind of vital rates are. We don't know what their uh, reproduction rates are um, and what reproductive success is. And, and that's in, due in part because they nest in these dense colonies. Um, I mean, the only way to, to get that information would be to walk into the colonies. And when you do that, then you're gonna disturb the nests um, and nestlings will jump out or um, you create, because the vegetation is really dense, then we create these pathways where potentially predators can get in. Um, so it's been a real big challenge for us to try to understand, you know, the full demographic uh, picture for this species. Um, and, and therefore try to understand, try to get to a, to a threshold number. Uh, I think I've, I've heard some folks Throw, throw around uh, like 700,000 birds um, as kind of like a target number for the population where then we could potentially like really rein back our, our efforts, uh, our conservation efforts. Um, but I, I'm not too familiar with how that number was, uh, was determined. Yeah, that all, all seems uh, really critical when 99% of the, 
of tricolored blackbirds live in California. So it's either, you know, it's either us or nothing, right? Right, right. And, and it may be best if we never find out what that low end threshold is. So uh, that'd be right. good not to learn it, I guess. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point too, because we have had some conversations about, um, you know, I mean, dairy, the dairy industry is, is kind of under threat in California. A lot of dairies are closing. And so in some sense, we're losing that, that quote unquote habitat that the tricolors have been using. We've already lost the wetlands. We might be losing these dairy silage fields uh, in greater numbers, greater acreage of loss in the next five years, 10 years. Uh, you know, so hopefully we can figure out a solution there. Uh, and, and hopefully, yeah, I don't know, we can create more habitat. But we are seeing, you know, some folks like uh, uh, Dan Arola, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He does a lot of work in more of the foothill areas with tricolored blackbirds. And so over the last few years, he's actually been noting, observing more birds kind of moving up slope into those kind of, uh, uh, yeah, more like oak savanna type of habitats where maybe there's like a stock pond or there's big brambles of blackberries or something like that, that birds are nesting in. Um, he, he's re recording that there's not as large of colonies, but there's more colonies. Um, and so potentially, you know, potentially maybe we'll see the shift as we lose these dairy silage fields, birds are gonna be moving into these other areas um, outside of the valley floor uh, where, where they can find good habitat. Is, is a drone, uh, and I, I don't think a drone is the, in, the answer to everything, but would it have any effect as far as flying high and surveying the colonies? No, that's excellent, excellent uh, that you brought that up because that is something that we have been exploring or wanting to explore. I know um, uh, Bob Meese from UC Davis, he actually just this past year was able to use one um, to fly over a, a colony, uh, not for the purposes of, of trying to survey them, but he was just trying to see like what kind of potential impact it, it had on the colony. And he said that the birds could care less. Um, so that was kind of exciting to hear that. You know, we can think that maybe we could equip one of those with like an infrared camera or some other sensitive kind of photography equipment um, to try to detect like the extent of the colony within a wetland or one of these fields. Um, and maybe if it, I don't know how advanced the technology is, but maybe even uh, it could pick up on individual nests or something like that. But yeah, I think that that's a, a good opportunity that we need to explore more. Do rice fields have any populations or colonies in them? You know, um, I... yeah, I mean, I, I've heard of, I know that the birds will forage in, in rice fields uh, and in like kind of north of Sacramento, they'll typically nest in the refuge, uh, in the wetlands on the refuges. Uh, but then they really use and rely on the rice fields for foraging habitat, which is, you know, when you're a colony of 20,000 birds, having a lot of foraging opportunity and habitat is critical um, to the, the success of the colony. And so, um, so rice is a really important uh, land cover type that, that they use. Um, 
I, yeah, I'm not sure about nesting. I don't think that the vegetation gets uh, tall enough and dense enough for them. Mm -hmm. uh, right. But, you know, I wouldn't be surprised, I guess. Maybe certain, certain uh, types of rice and maybe smaller groups of birds. You know, I, I don't think I would expect to see 10,000 birds nesting in, in rice, but maybe a, a few dozen. But there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of landscape that we don't survey or we can't get to. And so, uh, yeah, it's possible. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, well, I was going to mention uh, one other thing when you when you were talking about the uh, um, <clears throat> the way to spot uh, tricolor uh, amongst uh, red winged blackbirds is their call is very distinctive. Uh, so anybody that's looking for tricolored blackbirds. Um, Go to uh, Cornell is all about birds or something and listen to the call of the tricolor blackbirds because it's definitely unique. And once you hear it, uh, you won't forget. It sounds like, to me, it sounds like a, a herd of cats uh, fighting or, or conversing with each other. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, anybody else have any other questions? I see a couple of questions that popped up in the chat from Mary Ann. Um, she asked about killing off Himalayan blackberry thickets. Um, that that is one of the the habitats, one of the the vegetation types outside of wetlands and these silage fields that the birds are really keen in on. I mean, that's been kind of a controversial thing within our working group, even because Himalayan blackberry is non-native. Um, and so we, you know, we, I would say, yeah, if you don't have to, don't take them out. You know, a lot of birds forage on the berries and will nest in it. Uh, you know, it's not ideal, um, but as long as it's not out of control, you know, it still provides quality uh, nesting opportunity for for not only tricolors, but a lot of other species. Um, and then the other question was, does mosquito control present problems? You know, and I, I, I'm still learning about kind of the timing of when the mosquito control happens, especially in like rice country. Um, but as far as like down further south in the valley, like Tulare and Kern County, I don't think it, it's a problem. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the issue would be uh, that if they, when they spray to, to kill the larva, the mosquitoes, I mean, that reduces food resources for the birds. Um, yeah. That's a good question though. That's something I, I need to spend some more time thinking about. Yeah, so do they use, uh, they use a low flying aerial disbursement for those huge areas for mosquito control in the outside of urban areas, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, I never actually thought about that, yeah. Yeah, I know that's a, I mean, that's been an, uh, at least a, not an issue, but something that some of those other programs that I was mentioning at the beginning of the talk with like flooding rice post harvest or doing these like spring wetland programs, um, kind of un understanding when those particular landowners or regions are needing to do that mosquito control. And so uh, trying to kind of align those practices with when that that's going to happen. So we don't uh, you know, so we don't mess up their program, but we're also able to provide quality habitat for the birds. Yeah, it's a complicated issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any more questions? 
Great program, Geronimo. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Thanks thank for, you. for having me uh, join you this evening. It was, it was a pleasure. Really good. Great. Yeah. We're grateful. Thank you very much, Geronimo, for being willing to join us and for the hard work on the program. It's great. Yeah, thank of course. You. Of course.